Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast. I am thrilled and honored to be sitting this morning with Forrest Moretti, who is an independent researcher whose books I have been grappling with. My suggestion to you at home is that you find a chair and sit in it so you don't fall over when you hear some of what Forrest has to tell us. Forrest, welcome to Dark Horse. Hey, Brett. Uh, thanks for having me. It's an honor to sit in this chair across the screen from you. I'm looking forward to an interesting conversation. Yes, I have zero doubt it's going to be an interesting conversation. Uh, let's start with some basics. You are an independent researcher who has, through some mechanism that you will tell me, um, become deeply involved in questions surrounding iatrogenic harm, that is harm done by uh, doctors and medicine, and then the larger question of industrial society and its impact on human health. Is that a fair summary of your interest? Yeah, I, I um, through some medical journeys and frustrations with my uh, family and some things uh, they've gone through, uh, like a lot of people, finally got to the point where I felt like um, not only did the doctors not have answers in, in some cases, um, their recommendations were um, at best misguided and at worst harmful. And through that frustration, um, as is the case with any sort of uh, loving human being, you start doing research, you start looking for answers. And uh, me and my wife both got very curious and started doing some reading and um, were, I suppose, progressively horrified by what we started to find as we went down the uh, proverbial rabbit hole. And uh, yeah, it, it ended up uh, at the point where I became convinced that a lot of disease as we now describe it was in fact man-made. And this is not new to probably many of your listeners, but at the time, seven, eight years ago, when I first started reading this, I, I was absolutely flummoxed by how much of modern disease appeared to have man-made origins. So that was essentially the beginning was frustration in, in our own journey. And like a lot of people, um, it, it led to uh, a lot of answers and a lot more questions, but here I am. Up, still writing books, still trying to find the answers to things, but I, I think we've got a few. Um, so maybe we can talk about those at some point. Yeah. So let's uh, just sort of set the stage for the conversation here. My my uh, viewers know I'm not a journalist and this is not an interview. It's a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much you know about my background, Forrest, but um, my wife and I, Heather, have written a book the title of the book is A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, but there's a part of me that wishes that it had been named Hyper Novelty. And the idea of hyper novelty is that humans, though we are the most rapidly evolving species that has ever existed on this planet, are unable to keep pace with the rate of technological change. And so we are constantly effectively a fish out of water and this uh, hyper novel environment in which we don't even get to be adults in the same world that we were children in is making us sick physically, psychologically, socially. Um, so uh, I was shocked and fascinated when I read the first book of yours that I encountered. Um, to discover that what I thought I understood of polio was just simply wrong. And further, what I loved about your book, The Moth and the Iron Lung, about poliomyelitis, is that you did not find yourself defaulting into a simplified alternative story. Mm. The full complexity of polio is represented there so that the parts of polio that we all think we understand are better explained by the model that you put forward. And then your model also explains a good many things that are not present in what most of us have come to, to believe about it. So um, this is 
fabulous from my perspective in multiple regards. One, you're a true dark horse. You're not a mm. professional biologist. You're somebody who has been driven to research these questions for some reasons that are personal and some clearly uh, deep intellectual fascination with important topics. And it has led you to um, models that obviously have a high degree of predictive power. Mm -hmm. um, I've got more to say, but I'd love to hear your reaction to that so far. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let me just preface anything I say over the next hour, two or three in that the things I propose in these books, I don't know if they're true. I can't be certain of them. I wish I could. So rather, I, I mentioned this in the Crooked book at the beginning, rather than put a giant footnote at the end of every sentence I say, I, I want your listeners to understand, I think what I say to be true, I, I do, I, I'm fairly convinced of it, but I don't know uh, until we have the technology or the faculties of human reason that go beyond what's currently possible, we don't know for sure. So I'll just preface it with, this is my understanding of the way things work. I think what I'm saying is true. And uh, sort of ironically, I hope what I'm saying is not true. Because unfortunately, if what I'm proposing is true, then it's horrible. And, and it's a, a very dark reality that humans are going to have to come to terms with at some point. So regarding um, yes. the moth, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no. Well, I just wanted to say, I wanted to just say a couple of things with regard to that. For one thing, Dark Horse viewers and listeners are well familiar with the distinction between hypothesis and theory, which Great. I was happy to see you actually covered in your book. Um, I, you know, if I had, I've got the most minor critiques of your book. I thought it was uh, excellent. I'm talking now about the moth and the iron lung, which okay. is the only one that I have finished. I'm still right. involved in reading. Well, let me have but, it. Give it to me. Um, well, no, I was just going to suggest that you allude to the distinction of hypothesis from theory. And I just, you know, I, I, I wished you would leaned on it more heavily because what I say is that it actually is very important that we, um, we monitor that distinction and know exactly where we are relative to it when we speak, because it tells you the rules of engagement and you don't need to footnote anything. Once you've said, here is a hypothesis, and then you can say, this is why I believe it to be true. It has predictive power over these three things, which aren't predicted by any other hypothesis, that, that sort of thing. So the fact that, that the ancients delivered us a tool that tells us exactly at what level to, uh, to, to absorb a particular concept, um, it, it's a pity we've forgotten the distinction, but I was, I was glad you, you used it to some extent. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, with Moth and the Iron Lung and polio, um, polio is sort of, as I've described it, the foundational uh, myth or tale, depending on whether you believe it or not, that undergirds nearly all of modern scientific um, recognition, all of modern scientific laud and honor that's bestowed upon it. And there were often rumors of things about polio that sounded odd to me, that sounded strange. There were rumors that the pesticide DDT had something to do with polio. And it wasn't a, a real fascination of mine uh, until I, I started looking into the story and, and was confused because polio was essentially first diagnosed or recognized in the United States in 1894 in a town called Rutland, Vermont. And you know you can go on any web search and ask for when is the first epidemic of polio, and they'll tell you it's 1894. Uh, so a, a tiny bit of research with a tiny bit of an open mind will quickly lead you to the fact that that outbreak of polio included animals. So anyone who's done cursory research on polio will 
quickly relate to you that, wait a minute, polio doesn't strike animals. In fact, there's only one type of animal on the planet you can do meaningful polio research on, and it's a, it's a monkey. And uh, so that was it's enough. Old, it's an, hold on. It's old, an old, old world, world monkey. monkey. Yeah. Um, and that's important because it does suggest this would be a classic virus mm -hmm. that was limited phylogenetically. It's a human virus that can only infect something closely related to us, like um, an old world monkey. The fact that new world monkeys are too distant, that would mm -hmm. fit with a, yep. a classic model. Go yeah, ahead. that's right. It, the fact that the earliest outbreak of polio included so many different types of animals among its victims made me question immediately i'm sure brett you've developed a, a little sixth sense a little spidey sense that goes off immediately and says now wait a minute something doesn't add up here uh the first epidemic of polio in the united states and animals are being stricken something is going on so that was an immediate yes. red flag to me something that that sense that something is wrong in fact it it fits with what uh, i believe isaac asimov said that the most important phrase in science is not aha it's that's funny um <laughs> that's awesome and, i've never heard that yeah it's 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 an important one um i would also just point out to you just since i know where you're headed having read the moth in the iron lung a tremendous amount of what the public understands about its own viral jeopardy comes from a small number of stories one of them is polio one of them is the Spanish flu. And then there's the question of SARS, MERS, and Zika, you know, these sort of recent um, outbreaks. And we reverse engineer a great deal from the idea that um, we understand we, the, the, the cause of poliomyelitis was discovered and the truly terrifying uh, epidemic was finally brought under control by the polio vaccine, the Salk vaccine, um, and that polio is now tantalizingly close to having been driven from the earth um, because of our diligence with that mechanism. Likewise, uh, the Spanish flu tells us just how dangerous a, an epidemic can be um, and therefore how serious uh, our behavior relative to uh, something that is beginning to spread might be. And SARS and MERS tell us something about how likely a virus is to jump from a zoonotic source to people uh, leading you know, Tedros, uh, the UN head to tell us it's not a matter of if, but when the next terrifying pandemic is going to, to leap to humans. And I think it's perfectly fair if you, if you did, if you use deductive logic and you take those cases to be your, um, your assumptions that these cases are what we've come to understand them to be, then you can extrapolate a lot about how likely a deadly pandemic is to spread what the best tactics are likely to be for preventing harm to humans, etc. But if those stories aren't what we think they are, mm -hmm. everything about that picture changes. And so um, this is why... Uh, you know, in a moment where polio might arguably be close to elimination, we should be very focused on that story because it's not just about uh, the danger of getting polio. It's about what that the actual implications of the polio story might be. And uh, I don't think they are what I was taught in school. Yeah, it. Uh, whether my hypothesis is true or not, we can all, I think, safely agree that the story we were taught is is at least wrong, again, if not worse, uh, horribly, horribly misguided and, and in such a way that it's caused the suffering of, of probably millions more than it otherwise would have had us humans been able to have had some candor, some humility and, and uh, transparency along the way. I, I mentioned uh, in a conversation we had that I approach these things historically more than scientifically. And one of the reasons a historical overview of things like this is 
is useful and in such a way that perhaps COVID can't be yet because we don't sort of have the history of COVID. Um, the, the lore around medicine, particularly vaccines, had not reached a fever pitch even in the 50s and 60s when the, the polio vaccines started to come out and, and then other ones were added, such as measles and mumps, it hadn't reached the savior complex level of lore within science. And so when you read about it, you feel that you're getting an honest look into what was actually going on. So if I may, polio, just so your listeners sort of understand the story, Polio follows the life cycle of, of a lot of disease in that, and when I say life cycle, I don't mean microbial life cycle, I mean epidemiological life cycle, in that uh, a pattern is noticed, there's suffering, let's say, a pattern is noticed, and uh, the description of said disease begins to form. Other patterns may begin, and, and perhaps the disease explanation gets a little wider. Now, as scientific research begins to form, descriptions of the disease actually get narrower, and the, the focus on things gets narrower so that the, the nomenclature you know, grows as like a tree, and it starts to get more specific. So when you do historical research on any sort of scientific inquiry— you need to keep in mind that as you go back further in time, you're likely to um, come ac across more generic descriptions of things. Because when we say polio today, when you or I mention that word, we instinctively think of paralysis caused by the polio virus. Our first sponsor for this episode is Helix. Helix makes truly fantastic mattresses. Have you ever been traveling and climbed into bed only to discover that the mattress wasn't comfortable? If you've traveled at all, it's almost certainly happened to you. Conversely, have you ever experienced the feeling of relief when you discover a great mattress, one that lets you sleep comfortably through the night? Helix is that mattress. It's amazing what a difference it makes. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that offers 20 unique mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences and your size, including a Helix Plus for big and tall sleepers and a mattress for children. Take the Helix Sleep Quiz online, and in less than two minutes, you'll be directed to which of their many mattresses is best for you. Do you sleep on your back, your stomach, your side? Do you toss and turn or sleep like a log? Do you prefer a firmer or softer mattress? All of these are taken into consideration with the Helix Sleep Quiz. Once you've found your perfect mattress, it's shipped straight to your door free of charge. Then you'll have 100 nights to try it out, and you can return it without any penalty. In addition, all Helix mattresses come with 10 to 15 year warranties. If anything should go wrong, your mattress is covered. Every Helix mattress combines individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top, providing excellent support for your spine. Helix mattresses are made in America at their very own manufacturing facility, and both mattresses and facility are 100% free of fiberglass, which is put in many mattresses as a flame retardant. Helix mattresses are built for human bodies and built to last. Helix also supports military, first responders, teachers, and students by giving them a special discount. We've had our Helix mattress for over two years, and we look forward to it providing us with many more years of excellent sleep. Helix is offering up to 30% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash darkhorse. That's helixsleep.com slash darkhorse. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Our second sponsor for this episode is Fast Growing Trees, a sponsor we're thrilled to have back as growing season gets underway. Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S. with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers. They have everything you could possibly want, like fruit trees, palm trees, evergreens, house plants, and so much more. Whatever you're interested in, they have it. Find the perfect fit for your climate and space. Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online, and your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. Along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, they offer free plant consultation forever. A thriving garden is healing in so many ways. Fast Growing Trees can help you get lush, healthy trees growing on your land quickly. We got a crab apple tree from Fast Growing Trees, and it's doing beautifully, now waking up after a cold, dark winter. 
We got it last year, it was packaged beautifully, and the tree inside was healthy and happy then as now. It's a focal point in our landscape. Whether you're looking to add some privacy, shade, or natural beauty to your yard, Fast Growing Trees has in-house experts ready to help you make the right selection with growing and care advice available 24-7. Ask about everything from soils to landscape design and they have good answers. This spring, they have the best deals online, up to half off on selected plants and other deals. Listeners to our show get an additional 15% off their first purchase when using the code DARKHORSE at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at FastGrowingTrees.com using the code DARKHORSE at checkout. FastGrowingTrees.com, code DARKHORSE. Offer is valid for a limited, valid for a limited time, of course. Terms and conditions may apply, as they always do. And if you trace the history of that word all the way back to the beginning, th there's all the way down the tree at the very beginning, poliomyelitis was a symptom. It was purely describing inflammation of the gray matter, the spinal cord. And you literally would see people use it as like I, I mentioned in the book, you have a headache or they might say you have a poliomyelitis, which is you have a lesion in your spinal cord and that's why you are experiencing paralysis. So it's important to understand as we speak about polio, keep in mind the clock on the side of the screen, the year, because as you go back in time, it didn't mean what you and I think of it as. So the reality of polio is it's really a description of paralysis, neuronal or paralysis of the, the neurons that cause weakness in your muscles. And we don't know why. You and I think of it as, oh, the poliovirus caused it. The reality, as we'll see if we continue this discussion far enough, is there were many, many different things that could cause this, most of which can be attributed to a, a man-made change that happened. It's easy to document. So uh, this uh, is a classic example. And in fact, all of the, your work that I've encountered so far uh, falls under the heading of what we say, welcome to complex systems. Mm -hmm. And we have discussed extensively on Dark Horse the fact that those who would apply the rules of complicated systems to complex systems create hazard after hazard. That complex systems have a, uh, a distinct toolkit for engaging them. And what you're saying is a perfect example. We have something phenomenological. You've got inflammation of the gray matter of the spine that is associated with paralysis. That's an observation. Mm. It would be strange if only one thing caused that. Inflammation is a very general condition, and the fact that the inflammation can lead to paralysis suggests there ought to be at least a short list of things that could cause this. And the idea that poliomyelitis is the observation of that inflammation, which I understand from you can only be positively ID'd after death, um, that you need to actually uh, look at the spine, a cross section, is that right? Well, it's, yeah, it's the only way you could trace positively. the actual origin of what the inflammation is coming from. Right, um, but the idea that, okay, you, ought, you would expect a number of things to be able to cause what was once upon a time called poliomyelitis, but that a historical process has caused um, scientists and doctors to hone in on a cause, which already is suspect, and then yes. to shorten the name as if the polio virus is synonymous with the inflammation that causes the paralysis. And... Um, one of the great strengths of your book is that it's not that the polio virus doesn't exist or isn't involved. Right. It's involved in a much more complex story. And that story explains what, medi what uh, medical professionals, um, it explains their error as well as the phenomenology of the disease itself. Yeah, that was you know, this thing called Koch's postulates, which is essentially the, I would say at the time, a, a fairly uh, right, a, a good step in the right direction is to assume that uh, infection, you know, had one source, that there was one source of, of disease. If we could find it, 
and inject it into another healthy specimen and confirm that it, it affected that specimen in the same way, then we had isolated the cause of the disease. Now, sure, it makes sense. Probably has you know advanced the cause of science quite a bit. Unfortunately, um, yes and no. It, it's it's it, advanced it in a way, but it's a classic example of a rule from complicated systems applied to a complex system. Hmm. Um, the idea that if uh, this virus and this disease are really related, that nobody who's got the virus should uh, fail to have the disease and nobody who's got the disease should fail to have the virus. No, that's just simply but, not going to be true. Um, so the, the, has it done some good? Probably. Has it done more good than harm? That is a much more difficult question. Yeah. Yeah, well, keep in mind the the state of things in which it was born from it, at the time you might consider it an advance given the insane medical theories that were circulating at the time. So yes, you, you're absolutely right. It, it's not great, but it was an improvement on, on some things at the time and did advance the cause of microbiology of science in general of medicine in some way. But unfortunately the, when I say polio, without me having to air quote it every time, I speak of polio generically in the, in the context of paralysis from something. And unfortunately, they focused on a single virus as the cause, even when they knew there were multiple viruses, bacteria, and, and other environmental factors that could cause nearly the same thing. So as I was mentioning, going back to the, the original, um, that's funny, uh, discovery was 1894, uh, Rutland, Vermont, go to any website and they'll tell you that was the, the original polio outbreak in the United States. Horses died, dogs died, chickens died. Okay. Strange. Uh, why did that happen? Well, you know, wait, do wait, some wait, more wait. sleuth. Beyond, yeah. beyond, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, beyond no. strange because the there's a this is exactly why it's so important to think in terms of complex systems. A virus is going to have difficulty infecting the ability to infect one creature effectively comes at the cost of infecting other creatures. So they tend to be specific. The idea that this virus emerges out of nowhere and is capable of uh, inf infecting and apparently spreading between animals from many different clades is suspect on its face. It suggests a different kind of cause. And so uh, if, if you're looking at this from a com complicated systems perspective, you say, well, okay, viruses spread between creatures. These are creatures. They're all, you know, vertebrates, vertebrates. right? Um, and so anyway, you can talk yourself into believing that, yes, this meant that, okay, the virus is just very uh, capable of spreading between these, these many creatures, but the places where viruses spread between many creatures, there's a story to be discovered evolutionarily. You know, for mm -hmm. example, um, uh, viruses that spread between humans and domesticated animals, obviously there's an advantage to being able to hop that particular gap. So something that is capable of speaking uh, swine and human um, mm -hmm. has an advantage. Birds have a disproportionate capacity to distribute something across barriers because they fly. So anyway, there's always an evolutionary story. In this case, a disease comes out of nowhere shortly after the civil war and is spreading sort of incoherently between many different species that that's a that's a mega that's funny <laughs> yeah it is it, it's this actually the same that's funny that smallpox has if you've ever read anything about smallpox you know a, a disease that seems to infect uh, cow maids uh, through scratches on their hand from milking cows and and the uh, vaccine which is really an inoculation it's not a true vaccine in the modern understanding of it was derived uh, in a way uh, of a, a animal specific um, infection that could somehow grant humans to a, uh, to immunity. It's a, it's a strange, strange story. You should definitely say that's funny. If you start reading 
very much about the smallpox story. Oh, no. Forrest, yeah, you're not going to mess up my understanding of smallpox, are I'm you? I'm sorry. I, I, that's, that's number three in the hopper. I, I'm working no, on it. No, please, <laughs> please, please no, leave that one intact. Okay. I need well, it. We will, we will leave that one alone. Your, your uh, you know, epidemiological history of the world is, is safe. So back to the matter at hand, Rutland, Vermont, 1894, animals, horses, they even sent these animals, mind you, to forensics where they would do cross sections of their spinal cords and they confirmed, hey, poliomyelitis, they called it because remember, this is 130, 40 years ago, and they said what they saw, which is gray lesions of the spinal cord. So they called it poliomyelitis. They were being truthful. They were being accurate according to the definition of the term at the time. So with a minor bit of curiosity, such as I had, I started going through what was the most prevalent medical journal at the time, which is the Boston Medical Journal. At that time, Boston was the epicenter of all science and medicine in the world. It had been Paris for quite a while, and it was slowly moving to Boston. They have an incredible... Uh, history of documenting science and med medical progress in the in that journal you can get it online for free so what is a curious person like me to do i start reading through it saying odd what did they have to say about this outbreak um they didn't know that polio only infected animals at the time they were years they were decades away from understanding that so uh, in my research, I discovered that there was an outbreak the year earlier, something that I had never seen covered before. It was a tiny article that mentioned, uh, I think, 24, 25, 26 people had, uh, I can't remember if they had died or had become infected. Um, and, and it was interesting in that it was a year earlier. I had never heard of it. And um, it was fairly uh, in the same region of the country. It was just outside of Boston, which Vermont's fairly close. So that was enough of a that's funny. And then oh, that's really funny. That made me start thinking, wait a minute, something's going on here, uh, perhaps regionally at, at this time that may have had some impact on what they were calling calling the first epidemic of polio. So with the DDT story hanging over my head, which at the time I thought was pure folly. I, I laughed at people who said that DDT had something to do with polio. Uh, with that in mind, I said, okay, let's pretend maybe there's some truth to it. And I started researching po uh, DDT and discovered it wasn't put into, into civilian use until after World War II. It had been invented year, decades earlier, but was never discovered to really have the incredible uh, pesticide use case that it did. And, and it, it really was first used in World War II at, at, at scale. At scale. So, so hold on a second. DDT, yeah. even if we back it up to its invention rather than it's being deployed uh, in a civilian context, it's still way too late to account for the earliest outbreaks of poliomyelitis, right? Correct. Nowhere near. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense at all. If DDT is the cause of polio, it doesn't make sense. There, there's no way because we clearly, clearly had a problem decades earlier, 50 years earlier, made no sense at all. But uh, as I mentioned, I said, okay, if there is some truth to this, perhaps, perhaps there was some other environmental agent that was introduced into that area at the time that perhaps had some effect. So, um, you know, that that's actually the story of the entire book is me researching a profound invention, which is never told. We, we don't know the story uh, of this. And uh, I'm trying to keep your viewers in suspense. And uh, <laughs> it's, it was something that was so profoundly shocking to me that I had never heard this story and the correlation of space and time was so uh, in, uh, intense. I, I just couldn't believe no one had ever stumbled across this story. And that's sort of the, the excitement with which I wrote the book. Yeah. So I can, I can sort of cut to the chase here if you like. 
Um, yeah, let's put it this way. The book is so well done. I don't think it really removed, you know, there is a spoiler here. And I guess, uh, you know, for those who want to do it, maybe they should uh, put this on pause, <laughs> go read your book and then come back and uh, hit play. Sure. Um, but you know, I, th I think we're going to end up having to get into, into yeah. this for those who are, are willing to accept the spoiler, um, so that you, you have some idea why this is a compelling hypothesis. And again, I'm not saying it's true either, but the question is in light of the mainstream hypothesis and your competing hypothesis, which explains more and assumes less, that's the scientific question. Um, and so anyway, yeah, you want to uh, forge your sure. head here? Yeah, the only reason there is you, you even mentioned spoiler alert is because the book is written uh, in a way, there is a narrative to it. There is a story there that hopefully people find entertaining uh, while also being informative. But um, I discovered that in New England, at that very time, there was an invasive species of moth that had been begun destroying nearly every flora and fauna uh, across the region. It was called the gypsy moth. And it, it was an incredible, um, horrible event. If if you've ever seen pictures of it, um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll send you a couple of pictures you can put up on your screen for those who are watching, of the devastation this insect caused. I mean, it was mind-blowing. It looks apocalyptic to see these enormous heirloom 150-year-old trees being absolutely destroyed by this uh, by this creature. And completely so, denuded. Yes, exactly. Comple completely denuded. And I don't know if you're going to tell this part of the story, but I don't want to miss the fact that if we zoom out from iatrogenic harm, doctor caused harm and we zoom even past uh industrial society there's a question about just human error and the story of the gypsy moth is also in this very list this is not the usual story of an invasive species where we don't know who you know what sack of whatever it you know, rode in on. And all we know is the rough date at which people first noticed that it exists somewhere. You've got this story uh, historically nailed to a fairly well. You, you want to describe where the gypsy sure. moth came from? Yeah, it, it, as you mentioned, it's not typical that an invasive species such as kudzu or something can be traced to a single person on a single trip. Um, for whatever reason, um, a Frenchman who had moved to the United States uh, in hopes of a better life, had begun to cultivate uh, more hardy caterpillars because uh, the silk-producing caterpillars were prone to disease, the domesticated ones that all silk is created from. And so uh, he was studying them and, and crossbreeding them and trying different varieties. And at the time, I suppose the danger of invasive species was poorly understood. And uh, he brought a boatload of different insects over in his sure. attempt to try and breed a more hardy in, uh, version of something that could produce silk. So just to connect this up, one, we've got the Civil War, which interrupts the flow of cotton from the That's South. Right. Um, so there was desire for a hardy silk moth uh, caterpillar was greater because the value of silk was greater since its competing product wasn't widely available. The knowledge of the hazard of invasive species was not well developed at the time. Um, and the folly of attempting to crossbreed distantly related moths was not evident yet uh, because the, the understanding of what would make crossbreeding likely to work uh, was not well understood either. So, you know, these are all instances of um, you know, there's the historical connection to cotton and the Civil War, which just grounds the story so beautifully in history, um, but also the crudeness of our biological understanding uh, resulting in an error that uh, has, you know, effectively permanent ecological implications and much beyond as your book explores. So, yeah, pick up the story of uh, sure. what happened to that Frenchman's gypsy moths. Yeah, it. I'm waiting for uh, all first year students who, who intend on studying science to be given a plaque that says what could possibly go wrong 
and, and to make them hang it in every lab, every classroom they teach in, every lab they conduct experiments in, that they need to be reminded um, that humans are, in fact, um, very powerful. They they do have the ability to affect things in a way that they don't understand. And we have the power to screw things up at a level yes. we cannot appreciate. Our our ability to make them better, you know, we're pretty good at it as species go, but wow, does it lag behind our ability to mess up something that works. Yeah, the, the law of unintended consequences has, has yet to lose a single battle, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, I worry about that with antibiotics. I, I'm very concerned that antibiotics um, are will one day we will have been proven to have been wrong to ever use them in the first place uh, due to super really? creation, um, you know, due to intracellular bacteria and other things that we may cause. And and there are no more bacteria, no more antibiotics left that may control them. Now, currently, from our current perspective, they appear to be a win-win. I'm concerned one day. Um, evolutionary speaking, from a, a micro microbial perspective, we may in fact be setting the setting the the grounds for a superbug that can't be controlled. Well, hold I don't on know a that. Second. Yeah, I, I appreciate that you're saying this. You know, you're, you're being very careful. You're saying what you know and what you suspect, and that that's that's exactly how it should be done. But I do think it makes sense. Um, I should just tell you in the book that Heather and I wrote in you know, a hunter gatherers guide to the 21st century we said that the three greatest uh medical advancements in human history were vaccines antibiotics and surgery mm. we wrote that before covid which has caused <laughs> us to uh rethink the vaccine question sure um we are also and have been very skeptical of the way antibiotics are used. Um, and so far, um, my illusions are intact with respect to surgery. But let me just say, and you, I, I want you to put your position on the table here too. Sure. My position is in the end, we are very likely to discover that vaccines have a place, but that the technology by which they are produced is very important, and we've made wrong turns. Uh, adjuvants in particular are sure. a devastating error in vaccine technology history. We've also made an error thinking that we should be vaccinating against any disease for which we can come up with a useful inoculation, and we've also had our mechanisms for testing safety and effectiveness gamed by people with a perverse incentive uh, because yes. they're making money. So my guess would be where we ultimately get, if humanity survives long enough to figure out what we've actually done to ourselves, we will discover that antibiotics and vaccines are a precious technology that must be deployed very carefully for benefit to exceed harm mm -hmm. and that the willy-nilly use of antibiotics and vaccines has created huge self-inflicted wounds um, over m numerous generations uh, mm. and will will be recorded as a great error of medicine. Yeah. Well, um, I would respond by saying, um, don't read any more of my books. <laughs> Enjoy your life. You, you, you've got a great life. Uh, you're a happy guy. You're a smart guy. You know, nope. your vision of the world is very, very good and very rosy compared to mine. And, and I would say, just enjoy yourself. Don't, don't read no, anymore. No. It, it's not, it's not like that for us. And I, I have a feeling based on your, first of all, I want to know what's true. And the reason I want to know what's true is because it allows me, I can't do anything about the harm I've done to myself or my family already, but I can certainly reduce harm going forward, the better I understand things. So as much as um, there is a part of me that uh, does not want my bubbles burst, if they need to be burst because they're incorrect, that's where I, I am obligated to go and where mm. I ultimately know I will be um, better for having done it. But I should also point out, you probably don't know um, my history with uh, telomeres, senescence, and cancer. Is that a story that has not crossed your I path? I don't. I apologize. No, yeah, there's nothing to apologize for you. There's no reason you should know it. But um, 
When I was a graduate student, I was chasing down an evolutionary hypothesis about why we grow feeble and inefficient with age. And I was doing this, I had no uh, eye on medicine or treatment or reversing aging or anything like that. I was just interested in the evolutionary puzzle. And I ran up against an obstacle to my research. There was something that just didn't add up. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I knew if I could figure out what was wrong with what I knew that I, I could get all the way to a, an important answer. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, I spent a lot of time working on it. What it ultimately turned out to be was that the mice that we use for model organisms in laboratories, including for drug safety testing, had evolved in captivity in response to um, conditions in the breeding colony. Now, this is where that much we can say. <clears throat> um, I was able, with the help of a, uh, now I understand, terrible colleague, to <clears throat> establish that wild mice do not have long telomeres, even though science had decided that all mice have long telomeres, telomeres being the genetic sequences, the repetitive genetic sequences at the ends of chromosomes, which appear to control how many times a cell can divide before it stops. Mm. Um, so obviously it has a relation potentially to, uh, to why we grow inefficient with age. If your cells can't divide anymore, they can't repair damage and maintain the body. Um, but in any case, in captivity, mice had uh, evolved ultra long telomeres. Um, that part is now certain. The hypothesis that I advanced, which is actually now the only hypothesis left standing, so the probable explanation for that has to do with the breeding cutoff that for economic reasons, in order to produce laboratory mice at the most uh, economically efficient rate, um, you only breed animals up until something like eight or nine months, and then you throw them out and replace them with young mice because young mice breed faster. Mm -hmm. um, that caused the elongation of the telomeres, and the elongation of the telomeres looks poised to allow these animals to repair any damage that does not outright kill them at the cost of making them incredibly prone to cancer. I see. Interesting. Now, I think, I have no way of knowing what actually goes on inside of pharma. I think pharma did not know that the mice were rigged in a way that would make toxic things look safe when mm -hmm. I discovered the, the elongation of the telomeres uh, as a consequence of evolution in the breeding colonies. But once I did publish that result, I believe they understood that actually their profits were dependent on maintaining those broken mice. And we have seen numerous drugs, Vioxx, Eldane, Fenfen, Erythromycin, all the NSAIDs that do quote unquote heart damage. I don't think it is heart damage. I think it's body wide damage that we notice in the heart because the heart is a special organ. Um, but in any case, believe me, I'm under no illusions about okay. um, the goodness of medical research or the... Uh, the publicly minded nature mm -hmm. of our policies. I know that 20 years after I f figured out that the breeding colonies had resulted in the elongation of mouse telomeres, um, there is no official record that we've fixed anything. So oh. presumably the mice are still broken. Um, anyway, so that's where I'm coming I, from. I'm actually interested to hear more about that. Uh, if, if I can locate it somehow in that uh, I know that scientific, Scientific studies often are rigged ahead of time in that if you want to maximize the effect, you use mice. If you want to minimize the effect, you use primates. And there's all sorts of tricks um, you can use to game the system to get an outcome that your donors and grant grantors are going to be happy with. And unfortunately, human beings are not the rational creatures we think ourselves to be. We are as prone to putting our thumb on the scale as anyone else, and and that has served uh, the cause of humanity very poorly in in this. Well, I would, you know, complete uh, faith that humans are completely rational and are not prone uh, to bias and exaggeration, and your grant money coming in and your PhD being reviewed favorably. Um, I would say it a little differently. I would say we are rational 
pending a definition of rational, but the problem is we have competing interests. Mm -hmm. So what you, if you want science to work, your interests, you can't have a financial interest in finding X if ultimately it will turn out that Y is the right answer, right? Mm -hmm. But what we have now is a system in which all of the proxies that should flow to those who have the uh, most uh, far-sighted view of scientific phenomena, those proxies are all broken. And so we've got lots of people making careers uh, misleading us in ways they may not think of it in, in that way. But as you point out, it's very easy to rig a study. Um, you could do that intentionally, and some do. You could do it inadvertently, and you could do it structurally. The system could be built, you know, like I said, many of the people who use mice that are uh, broken such that they will make toxic drugs look safe, presumably don't know that they are uh, using rigged animals. Mm -hmm. Right. They just yeah. do it. And the point is the whole system is built to spit out answers that are um, financially useful, not medically. So, you know, oddly, you and I have uh, and I, I desperately hope that you've reached a conclusion that is a bit too strong. Um, but you and I have both found jaw dropping failures of uh, scientific inquiry that have led, I believe, to substantial human harm about which we are unwilling uh, to to go back and look. Yeah. The, the question that you posed to me about whether antibiotics are in fact um, on the whole, will, will they be in the positive column or the negative column for humanity? It obviously can't answer that uh, for a long time. My overarching belief is that nothing is free. There is nothing in nature that is free. Everything has a cost. We may hide the cost. We may delay the cost. We may disperse the cost in such a way it's spread out over a, a bigger population and we don't notice the effects as much. But regardless, the entropy of nature will always win in such a way that there is a cost. You may not be able to see it, but it's there. So with antibiotics, I, I've yet to find any technical or scientific invention that has been able to break that rule. And with antibiotics, well, my fear is it's a, it's a chronological delay that we may one day pay the price. It has certainly been a benefit for us now, no question about it. 50 years from now, I, we will see. I, I hope that it holds up. Well, but you have to ask that question in two different ways. Um, Obviously, we are behaving very stupidly with antibiotics, right? We're using, we're giving them to animals that aren't sick in order to slightly increase the rate at which they uh, put on mass uh, prior to slaughter. That's an insane waste of a precious technology. On the other hand, you don't die from gangrene. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, let's say that the only thing we did with antibiotics was um, make surgery, uh, make, make it tolerably risky um, by hedging out the, the risk of a serious runaway infection. Um, would that have, would it have negative consequences? I have no doubt that it does. In fact, the other thing you probably don't know about me is that my dissertation was on the logic of trade-offs, which oh, I'm, my claim is every biological paradox, things that we can't resolve, gets resolved once you realize that not only are trade-offs ubiquitous, but that there are rules that govern them. And you can begin to understand why the particular trade-offs that you see function the way they do. For example, um, why would you expect uh, a you know, a highly contagious virus not to be able to infect numerous different species, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's a, that's a trade-off and there are rules that govern them. So anyway, I agree with you. There's a cost to be paid for antibiotics and anybody who thinks there isn't is kidding themselves. The question is, 
if they were used with wisdom, would that cost exceed the benefit? And that's where I guess you and I differ. I suspect that uh, that wise use of antibiotics would leave them well in the positive column. Uh, will the abuse of antibiotics, the way we abuse them now, result in a net negative? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, but uh, surgery, for sure, t to me, the, the mechanics of surgery, of fixing people's car engines and all of that, certainly I, I would easily place that in, in the clear winner category. We, we have benefited from surgeons and surgery and improvements in that, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, but we uh, also see the same pattern. Sorry, again, I don't mean to interrupt you, but oh, we also see fine. the same pattern where a precious technology, right, the ability uh, to the straighten a bone that's been horrifyingly broken and won't uh, w won't Set restore it. itself, it. right? The ability to cut a tumor uh, out of you that would otherwise crowd out a vital organ. Mm -hmm. These are obviously highly valuable. On the other hand, some of what has to be corrected is also the result of uh, harm that industrial civilization is doing to us. And we see the absolute abuse of this technology in ways that are purely harmful. Um, you know, so it's like, not... For example, a, what, what do you mean, for example? Well, I would say, you know, let's just take, you know, the, the low bar. Mm. Um, the surgical destruction of the functional reproductive anatomy yeah. of a child. Yeah. Um, I would say that that is, um, you know, a, a, a despicable crime against humanity, um, you know, and the fact that the person doing it or one of the people involved is a surgeon uh, doesn't, it makes it worse in my book rather than better. Um, so anyway, we see the abuse of surgery the same way we see the abuse of antibiotics um, and vaccines. And, uh, you know, I think, I think your framing of the question is right. What, what is... In the end, will more good have been done by this technology than harm? And I would just add the question, were we wise about these things? Would the net value be uh, positive uh, in the end? And uh, I yeah. sure hope so. Yeah, I, uh, in the same way I question antibiotics, I certainly question vaccines, uh, whether the net result is, is a benefit to humanity. I, I happen to have fallen on uh, the negative side, but I'm I'm happy and certainly willing to admit that I'm wrong. I mean, this is something I, I talk about all the time is humble curiosity. I, I wish everyone approached the world with curiosity in, in that they want to understand how things work and at the same time, bring humility with you to admit, to, to be perfectly willing to admit you may have been wrong about something. So if everyone approached uh, science and, and everything beyond with that mindset, I, I think we'd be a whole lot better off. But uh, regardless, back to the polio story, the the initial realization that the gypsy moth uh, had been released by this Frenchman um, didn't concern him greatly because the like I said, the, the nature of invasive species weren't truly or fully understood. It did concern him. Evidently, th there was concern. Um, he left the house that he was living in. And within a few years, throngs uh, of these creatures started to appear. And because of, from what we understand, the prickly nature of their, their backs, their, the birds, the local birds weren't uh, properly designed or evolved to, to consume them. So they, they thrived and they, they grew to millions and millions and millions and began to decimate the northeastern countryside. The only pesticide they had available to them to use at the time was something called Paris Green which was, uh, strangely enough, actually a dye used to color wallpaper and children's toys. <laughs> uh, but it was also known to kill animals, uh, such was its toxicity, and they used it and it didn't work. It just essentially had no effect. So a, a, a giant search was launched in an attempt to figure out some way to stem the tide of, of the gypsy moth, which was essentially destroying the entire um, Northeast of the United States. And um, that's when they happened across a new pesticide, uh, which, which they called lead arsenic, which was essentially the combination of lead and arsenic together. 
the two of them, uh, when mixed properly, it was extremely viscous and it wouldn't wash off of things like uh, Paris green wood. Now, at that time, most people didn't use pesticides at all. It just wasn't popular enough uh, to use. Uh, because the gypsy moth was so prevalent and was decimating the countryside, there were massive campaigns to, to essentially coat every living surface with this pesticide. They didn't realize its toxicity, um, but it, it became apparent very quickly because the very year, the summer after the pesticide was invented was the summer that first uh, giant, giant outbreak of poliomyelitis was discovered in Boston. Um, a, a coincidence of time and space that I, I just found too uh, impossible, too strange to ignore. And that's really when I thought, aha, maybe there's a connection here. Maybe there was another pesticide which had something to do with the polio epidemics. And keep in mind, when I say polio, at this stage in time, I mean paralysis. Paralysis. And um, if I understand the story correctly, you can see in the fact of the gypsy moth spreading a human response to it, the toxicity of which is underappreciated, that mm -hmm. this would also mirror the phenomenology of an epidemic. Right. If you have the spreading of a moth from the place of its introduction and it's decimating um, people's trees and their uh, crops spreading out from where it was first introduced, it would leave the impression, the same impression or a similar one to something that was spreading person to person. Right. Mm -hmm. It would give the impression on the map of, uh, you know, something moving across the landscape when, of course, it's the moth moving across the landscape and human behavior um, uh, potentially compounding the uh, um, or potentially causing the medical response to it when the two things are, in fact, not connected. Yeah. In, in fact, you can uh, trace the spread of polio. In the beginning, this is, mind you, late 1800s, early 1900s, you can trace its spread by tracing the migration of the gypsy moth because as they moved, so too did the pesticide. And it's yeah. remarkable if uh, th this is, again, this is some napkin math here of me sort of looking at numbers and, and counts of things and, and, and doing it very roughly, but it was remarkable. The, the correlation was fairly strong. At, right. at this point, and oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm taking well, a turn here, so ask, let's stay here. Yeah, you, um, you mentioned Paris Green. And mind you, I'd never heard of Paris Green until I read your book. Um, Paris Green uh, was an effective pesticide in one regard, but not effective because you didn't know where you'd sprayed it and it washed off. So it required constant respraying. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And, Lead and arsenic what, was white and sticky and you could tell where you'd sprayed it and it couldn't be washed off, which should be a little harbinger of things to come. White and sticky. And so you have, um, yeah, I guess I will let you get to your, your uh, turn in the story here. But um, before we leave Paris Green, what, what made it uh, toxic? It was arsenic. It, it was, uh, you know, arsenic was essentially, unfortunately, a popular medicinal treatment at the time. Uh, people who haven't read this chapter in, in medical history should know that metals were thought to have essentially far greater positive effects on human anatomy than negative. They understood that there was toxicity related to metal ingestion. Of course, they knew that. This has been going on for thousands of years. They thought, as we've just discussed, the, the positives outweighed the negatives. So and, ch oh, yeah, children were given mercury um, tab uh, powders to, to deal with teething or dentition, as they called it. They, they assumed that um, the eruption of teeth you know, provided a pathway into the immune system, which may actually be true. And they thought, OK, well, give them some mercury. It'll clean out their bowels because it made you have massive GI problems. And then disease will leave the body. And, and, and that was the beginning. There were multiple other uh, medicinal treatments that involved arsenic and, and, and other metals. It, it was a horrible chapter in medical history. Right. So uh, this is fascinating to me because 
the extent to, I mean, okay, why was mercury being given by doctors to people? It was being given by doctors for a number of reasons, um, because it was an effective biocide and because it caused the uh, abrupt purging of the bowels, mm -hmm. right? So yep. doctors knew something. They had a crude understanding about how to influence the body. There's a degree of truth here. If you had something in your bowels, you know, if you had, if a microbe had gotten in and was causing uh, germ warfare to unfold in your bowels, making you sick, mercury would likely cause the purging of whatever was present. So it's not like there's not and a mechanism. everything else along with it. <laughs> everything else along with it. But why is that the response of the body to mercury? Because it's a horrifying toxin. And the <laughs> point is the body gets rid of horrifying toxins, right? If it, if the body uh, has reason to think that you have ingested something that's putting out a toxin that's causing your mind to become cloudy, it causes you to vomit. This is why, um, you know, alcohol poisoning causes people to throw up. The body is trying to purge something that's toxifying it. You can get the same effect if you make yourself sufficiently dizzy because the body has this mechanism for, you know, it doesn't know why you can't stand up. Maybe mm -hmm. you've eaten a toxin. So it, it causes you to vomit. In that case, it's useless. But, um, but the point is doctors trying to operate the small number of levers that they have that cause the body to do anything that might be useful in the context of some disease are doing something as insane as giving patients mercury not only yeah. patients but infants i mean yeah it's hard to imagine anything that crazy it was as common as you might give a child a, a, a teething child tylenol today it was that common it, it was not a fringe treatment it was not a tinfoil hat treatment like of some weirdo essential oil crazy mom i'm, I'm saying that facetiously for your listeners who uses it was, <laughs> but it, it was so common that everyone did it. It was expected your children would teeth. It was expected they might get sick and you needed to prevent this by completely nuking every possible uh, bacteria that lived in their intestines um, to prevent it. Now, well, interesting that you mentioned Tylenol, right? Because yeah. Tylenol isn't safe either, right? But this is a great way for people to understand how insane this mindset was and how normal it seemed at the time, right? The idea that we treat Tylenol as a no big whoop, you know, Tylenol is a tremendously dangerous drug. The idea that we think of it as safe enough to give to children is preposterous. Frankly, I don't think it's safe enough to give to anybody. I certainly don't take the stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I do take aspirin. I'm hoping you won't tell me that's an error, but, um, uh, but in any case, yes, uh, we did give infants mercury. Um, we still, I, I remember as a kid getting quite spooked by a 60 minutes report about mercury amalgam in mm -hmm. dentistry, which was at the time, the common way of filling, uh, cavities. Maybe it was the only way, um, yeah, that irony is... upon ironies, uh, the dentists who prescribed mercury amalgams for cavities uh, evidently didn't understand that cavities uh, can fix themselves. Your body can heal itself, and they are not uh, ratchet strap holes forming in your teeth that never go back. So, again, the body's ability to heal itself with patience and with some suffering will stupefy the, the modern listener because essentially we've been taught that all infection is bad, all disease is bad, all suffering is bad. Imagine if I were to tell you that your child ne needn't ever exercise because we have an injection of steroids that will build their muscles for them. <laughs> Somehow we might laugh at the suggestion of that. But if I were to say your child needn't ever get an infection, they'll be better off just getting a slew of vaccines their whole childhood. That's perfectly fine and acceptable. The reality is they're better off. Their immune system will function better. They will have a lifetime of immunity rather than a booster addiction for the rest of their life if they just get the infection naturally. This is certainly the case with measles, chicken pox, mumps, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of infections. Your children were better off if they just got it naturally. They would never need another booster again. And, and there was essentially no risk 
uh, particularly in healthy populations. Yeah, but we know uh, we we know enough at this point to say that the best thing you could conceivably do from the point of view of health is to provide an environment with as little evolutionary novelty in it as exactly. possible. Exactly. Right. Um, and that if you provided that environment, then the body is in a great position to take care of itself. And that what we, what we are doing, what we have now seen with COVID and what you reveal in the case of um, polio is likely the case is we are taking um, unintended consequences of technological advancement and compounding the damage with a complicated systems view of medicine. Um, so we're just, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, the old lady who swallowed the fly for symptoms caused by cures caused by other cures, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a frightening if there's, picture. If there's any success to be mentioned about the smallpox vaccine, I apologize for this footnote. Oh no. <laughs> it, it is the timing. It was the recognition that a healthy person could battle infection more easily and readily than an unhealthy person so the inoculation of smallpox, which again, I, I will stress, it was not really a vaccine at all. You were simply giving people the smallpox uh, infection itself. It was the timing of it that if, if there was success to be had, it was because they recognized healthy people can suffer through this infection with very few ill effects. So if, if you're at a point of optimum health, let's go ahead and get it over with. You're going to catch it anyway. So... Back to the, the purging of the bowels and the metal and, and mercury powder. The If you really go back in time, you will find in wait, 1840... Wait, wait. Oh, hold, hold on, ahead. hold on. Sorry, I, I'm my mind is trying to uh, correct for the uh, upheaval that you're I'm creating. I'm sorry, the, I, I apologize, it wasn't here. enough. But let me, let me push back then. Um, tell me what I have wrong in this story. All right. Smallpox was not present in the New World until Europeans arrived in uh, 1492. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, as far as uh, I as think far as you know. that's true. Yes. Okay. It devastated the New World population, which at the time is estimated to have been between 50 million and 100 million people between North and South America. Is that, I, I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm not asking you to go through this with a fine tooth comb. I'm just trying to sure. figure out where the story I understand is in error. Okay. I think there were native populations that were particularly susceptible to the effects of the smallpox, vaccine, uh, smallpox infection smallpox infection, which came with the Spaniards. The native populations were disproportionately healthy because, well, because they lived in the environment that their ancestors lived in for the most part, and technology had not begun to introduce, uh, the various um, influences that degrade health. So they were recognized by the Europeans, certainly, to be healthy and robust people. So the question then, and I, I can see a couple ways to go here, but the model that you've just put on the table is that small the smallpox vaccine mostly what it did was give people smallpox when they were in good health such that they were more likely to fend it off and then they develop natural immunity rather than the textbook version in which the uh the attenuated virus um provides the immune system with a trial run that isn't highly virulent and then when they encounter actual smallpox they fend it off without even knowing that uh it has gotten into their system so the question then is why if that model is correct was the native population in the americas susceptible to smallpox when it arrived well 
let me just uh, mention something as a as a lead into the answer to that. The the smallpox vaccine, as I'm labeling it, an inoculation. There is no idea what is in that inoculation. Even today, scientists don't know what's in it. And the reason that is, is because it was grown in the tissue of different animals constantly. They, they might lacerate the belly of a, of a calf or a cow, you know, put some of the solution in there and grow it. And, and they did it with goats and with rabbits and with pigs and all kinds of different animals. So we, when we talk about smallpox, we don't really know what it was. We, we don't know conclusively uh, what the Indians died of. Sure, maybe they developed postules on their skin from an infection that the Europeans brought over. We don't know what that was. Zoonotically or, you know, because of all the animals, the vaccine had been passaged through over a hundred or so years. We don't know what it is. So I can't sit here and say conclusively, I know what uh, North American natives died of, because there's no telling what it was. There's no telling what they brought over. Given the uh, rampant, irresponsible development of that vaccine, and, and the vaccine itself was so inherently dangerous that people were terrified of it. And it, it, it was... Uh, the, the vaccine itself was rolled out in the 1970s, not because smallpox was eradicated, but but because people just still were having too many horrible reactions to it. And and so it's difficult for me to conclusively say what Native Americans were dying of, g given the Frankenstein nature of whatever is in that syringe. And, and you can go lo look at it today and scientists will not be able to tell you what's in the smallpox vaccine. They have no idea. Now, I'm sure if there was enough money, they could sequence it, and perhaps they have, but we're too horrified to publish the results. But it, it's not um, anything, I think, naturally occurring. I, I think it is sort of the antiquated equivalent of the coronavirus. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to have to chew on that. I was not expecting the concern to be over the content of the vaccine. Well, and now keep in mind, whatever was in the vaccine was purple, perfectly capable of replicating. You know, you, you mentioned attenuated virus. There was nothing. They couldn't do that. They had no clue that passaging viruses over multiple generations of, of, of life would sometimes attenuate, you know, the virulence of the, the virus. They had no, they had no understanding of that at the time. They were just trying to keep it alive. They thought there was a cowpox virus, vaccinia, as they called it that if they could just keep it alive like a sourdough starter, they could, you know, just scratch the skin of people and, and hey, they would get a very mild infection compared to smallpox. Now, the reality is it was probably the same thing. So they, wait, they didn't do you, know the difference. Do you doubt the Jenner story of Jenner having noted the immunity of milkmaids oh, to smallpox? Certainly. certainly. That, I'm, I'm sorry, bro. I told you to stop. I told you to stop. <laughs> it's lore. It's absolute lore. Look, no, no, look, he it's was lore. a I... fraud. He was a scientific fraud who paid for his PhD or doctors at a fake university. He was laughed at by all his peers. Don't do this. Don't go down the rabbit hole. It, it's it's horrible. It, you don't want to do wait, this. Wait. No, no. I mean, uh, look, we have no we have no choice here. Um, I'm just trying to under look. I, I'm not. Uh, I. Uh, I'm going to follow the evidence and I'm going to figure out Certainly. what I believe. But at the moment, you're telling me something that I have not heard before. All right. Um, just for the listeners trying to keep up. The story is that Jenner and apparently the story, this is the effectively European version of the story. There are several discoveries of the same phenomenon from different cultures um, but the European version is that Jenner notes milkmaids are immune to smallpox and comes to understand that they have picked up a closely related disease, cowpox, which is sufficiently close that it results in the immune system developing natural immunity that causes it to manage smallpox without incident. 
That's so, funny. Have we ever heard <laughs> of that story in any other any other research paper ever published? Have you ever heard a similar story to that? I haven't. That's funny. What do you mean? You would expect it to show up in the story in which the pattern was clearest, just exactly the way you expect our understanding of genetics to emerge from uh, mm -hmm. Mendel's messing with peas at loci that just happened to work in a simple fashion. If he'd worked with any complex trait, he wouldn't have seen the pattern that he saw, but it happened that we uh, had, you know, so who knows how many people did an experiment with some uh, trait that is multigenic uh, where you couldn't get a clear pattern, but Mendel mm -hmm. happened to be messing with the wrinkling of the seeds, um, et cetera, which were inherited in a simple fashion that we now call Mendelian. Um, but anyway, the point is you would expect the story to show up where the story was simple enough, uh, simple enough for us to grasp it. So I still like the idea, even if this is the only case where we have two diseases closely enough related that you get um, cross reactivity sufficient for one disease to function as a vaccine against the other. Mm -hmm. You don't believe that story. Well, I have never heard of another case of a similar virus being used in its pure form as an inoculative agent against its sister virus. I mean, think about the genetics technology we have at our at our disposal right now, and we still cannot find anything similar enough to substitute, you know, for its more virulent cousin. You know, we have to create things from scratch or, you know, old school vaccine production. We passage it and hope that it becomes less virulent or we nuke it with formaldehyde and hope that we inactivate it. But the notion that there was a cousin virus that just happened to be found on, you know, the udders of cows and it inoculated people safely for a, a closely related virus, I've never seen it happen anywhere else. And given the technology available at the time to, to know these things and to accurately document what was happening, it, it rings as implausible to me, particularly given uh, the, the horrific nature of the smallpox vaccine itself. It, it was. It does not have the shining diamond story wrapped around it that the polio vaccines do. E even amongst people, you, you know, who who would differ with me on general vaccine opinions, that they would probably admit, you know, smallpox vaccine. It it was it was horrible. It was not something you really wanted your children to get because it it caused a lot of problems, a lot of death. I mean, this is vaccinia. This is they had a name for dying of the vaccine. It was called vaccinia. So. Anyway, all right. Well, I, I mean, apologize. You know, no, no, you don't need to apologize. Uh, let's put it this way. I, I am left with two questions. One of them is the Jenner story itself as separate from the question sure. of the um, utility uh, and safety of the smallpox vaccine. And I now know from having watched the COVID shenanigans up close and having read about uh, polio that there's always the possibility of a pattern of uh, disease amelioration being credited to a vaccine that was actually not involved or involved in a way that was not obvious, not what it says in the textbook. So yeah. anyway, I'm... I don't I don't know what to think about these things. I am definitely like many people in the process of discovering that much of what I thought about um, medicine and disease is not uh, is not entirely true and in some cases not true at all. Yeah. Um, you know, which is why at the, at the top of this, I raised the issue of Spanish flu, which is a story I thought I understood. Um, and it turns out uh, until you know about um, bacterial pneumonia and mm -hmm. about aspirin toxicity, you don't understand the Spanish flu either, right? So all of these stories have a, um, a valorization and an oversimplification that causes us to rethink the whole picture when we begin to see how unlikely it is for diseases to jump from nature 
into people, how the examples of epidemics that are used to frighten us aren't what we were led to believe they were, um, and how the technologies that we were told addressed these um, may not have been involved at all in some cases and have, mm. may not have been involved in the way we've been told in other cases. So maybe, maybe we should get back to the story of <laughs> polio um, so we yeah, can see how that plays out. I will out. say that you used the word valorization. That, that's a really great word be, because that is the problem. It, humans want the hero. We, we want the heroic story of science over evil, the evil microbe. And even if the scientists themselves have conducted all trials and research and vaccine development, and everything else with absolute precision and rationality, humans who don't have that same amount of reasoning will swoop in and distort the story. They will turn it into a myth and to lore of something that absolutely didn't happen. And th that's essentially what happened later on with the polio vaccine, unfortunately. Um, the valorization of the vaccine was was written in stone before it had even begun to be distributed. So back to the matter at hand, uh, as I mentioned, there in 1841, there was actually a, I'm quoting in the air, epidemic of polio. Some 12 or 13 children were either sickened or killed. And it, it was, all the children, evidently it had been mentioned in passing in the article, were, were going through dentition or had recently done it. And we, we know they were likely being given um, metallic medicine as treatment for whatever. But the cluster, the cluster was enough that it makes you think that there's something going on. There is a vector here that is not purely environmental toxicity. There's something else going on. And you start to see that as you trace through the earliest polio epidemics. You have to start understanding that this is not purely uh, poisoning from pesticide. There is something else to it that gives it the telltale sign of the vector of a, an advancing disease because of the clusters of the way things happened. And, and you, you see that, and, and early on, the earliest polio outbreaks were all rural because, in my opinion, this is where pesticides were being used most aggressively. But there was something to the fact that there was a viral component at work here. It wasn't just a pesticide. So one of the telltale signs of polio, as they called it back then, was the full name of polio at that time was acute, polio, acute poliomyelitis of the anterior horn. And the anterior horn, if, if, if you're looking down on your spinal column, the anterior is the front half of your spinal cord. That's the part of the where the neurons that run through their control of movement, neurons on the backside of your spinal cord control taste and, and sensitivity. And polio, for whatever reason, would only cause paralysis. It didn't affect your, your sense of uh, touch. It didn't cause pain, which is what lesions on the back of your spinal cord could do. Now, All right, now so here's, we, a, here's a major that's funny, yes, right? Yes. Because you're talking about something where a virus is ostensibly causing inflammation on the front of the spinal cord, but not the back. And the same virus is apparently indifferent to whether it's infecting people or chickens, <laughs> right? So you're, this does not add up at some level because the specificity, right? There's probably no chemical distinction between the neurons on the front side of your spine and the back side of your spine. If there is anything, it's tiny. It's at the level of, uh, you know, tiny modifications of receptors potentially. But um, the idea that the virus is so specific that it infects the front part of your spine, but it doesn't care if you're a chicken or a person, that's a, that's funny to me. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. As you, so anyway, as, as you read through the early case reports of polo, you will you will start to pick apart the differences. You will see people that had seizures. Okay, this is not this is not a hallmark of a polio infection. A polio infection, for those of you who don't know, it's an enteroviral infection. It's a virus that thrives in your gut, 
causes you to have diarrhea, all kinds of other problems, anything, you know, associated with gut, poor gut health. So wait, wait, have- wait, that, that, that is again, a that's funny. Yes. Right. An enterovirus that is at home in your gut that is causing inflammation of the front side of the spine. Yeah. First of all, that's again, a, a kind of an incoherent picture, right? The point is it's adapted to the gut, right? Yet it finds itself in the spine where it does a whole different kind of damage. It's only in the front side of the spine or generally so. Yes. Um, so, and then why again, is it in the spine? Is does the spine provide it some mechanism to leap from one individual to the next? Well, uh, you're begging the question here, but yes. Uh, interestingly enough, if, if your listeners don't know this, the disease was often called infantile paralysis, just so you know. Why infantile paralysis? Well, because it struck children, it struck babies, infants. Um, it was very, very rare for a true enteroviral polio infection to even infect an adult, most likely because they already had immunity to it. Immunity, by the way, gained without any sort of paralysis and without any knowledge of themselves even having the infection themselves. But something happened around that time in the in human history where suddenly these enteroviral infections appeared capable of paralyzing people, which is very, very odd that that would start happening, and particularly children. Now, one of the odd things, if I another one more that's funny, is the infection, the paralysis almost always started in their legs. This was the hallmark understanding of polio. You remember, we start very generic and say people have lesions in their spinal cord and they're kind of paralyzed. And then we start getting more specific in that it's children, it's infants, and hey, it's only the front of their spinal cord. It's not the back. They don't have sensitivity and pain, which are commonly associated with poisoning, with metallic poisoning or pesticide poisoning. They get paralysis in the front side of their spinal cord. And if you've ever, do you, do you remember the Tyco racetracks, the little slot car racetracks you had as a kid? Oh, yeah. And you know, you put your car in and it just races off. This is how neuronal tissue grows and how viral uh, viruses that thrive within neuronal tissue, this is how they propagate. When they hit a neuronal channel, they're, they can just shoot up. They don't like replicate at random, just sort of crossing organs here and there. When they hit that slot, of neuronal tissue, they start going up. So if you can imagine your spinal cord, infants where the intestines rest directly against uh, the bottom of the spinal cord, um, it's kind of cutting to the end of the book, so one of my hypotheses, but essentially the paralysis starts in the bottom of the spinal cord, the, the part of the nervous system that rests directly against the intestines, a geographical proximity that just feels too significant to overlook. And as soon as a virus hits the neuronal tissue, it, it doesn't move backwards, it moves up because again, it's a highway that, that these enteroviruses, uh, certain enteroviruses propagate along and it would start going up the spinal cord. And so you might start with a, a limp, limpness in the legs and then it might move itself up and your spine might start uh, having problems. And then eventually it would paralyze the muscles that allow you to expand your diaphragm and, and fill your lungs with air. And that's essentially, that was the real danger with polio in terms of death in that it could prevent you from inhaling and exhaling because the paralysis would start in your legs and work its way up. So yeah, the, the, that's funny about all the cases you read about polio, especially early on are sometimes people developed seizures. Okay. It's not polio. It's not the way we define polio nowadays. Some people would develop, uh, extreme pain sensitivity, extreme, like you couldn't touch their leg without extreme pain. This is um, FDR, you know, the the American president who famously had polio, as we describe it uh, now, had extreme pain sensitivity, a a very odd side effect of something that's decidedly not polio. But anyway, as these cases started to grow and more and more information came in, they started thinking that um, perhaps there are multiple viruses and bacteria that can cause this problem. And they were right. They would infect uh, experimental primates. Once again, they had sort of discovered the, I think it's the macaque that they could infect readily. They could infect them with 
uh, poliovirus, with something called Coxsackie virus, with something called um, echovirus, certain bacteria. They discovered there was a, a, a plurality of microbes that would do this exact same thing if injected directly into the nervous tissue. That was the problem, was they couldn't understand how do these viruses and bacteria get into the nervous system in the first place? Because your, you know, your mucosal immune system is incredibly robust and can protect your body from nearly anything. I mean, think about what your dog eats, you know, from day to day at, and suffers no real ill effects from it. But their real conundrum was how does this virus get into your nervous system? They just couldn't understand it. So, okay, a couple things. One, the virus in the nervous system uh, is a red flag for me. How so? Because I'm an evolu no, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I think in terms of the ecology of creatures, and although viruses aren't technically creatures, we have to think of them in the same terms. They've still got to reproduce and get into new hosts to do it. There are viruses that utilize the nervous system as a way of getting from one person to another. Herpes viruses, for example, use the nervous system so we can describe their life history mm -hmm. and see why neurons are a chosen location. They can hide from the immune system there. They can travel uh, to places where they then jump in ways that we understand from one person to another. It's not obvious why an enterovirus is inhabiting the nervous system at all. I've never heard a description of how it gets from one person's nervous system to the next. Um, maybe that description exists somewhere, but I don't know it. Um, but it is also fascinating that if you solve the problem of the virus getting into the nervous tissue, you can basically use nervous tissue as a, an environment, a growth medium, hmm. and you can cause the paralysis. So the point is what this is pointing to, which your book addresses beautifully, is the idea that effectively this virus may be perfectly capable of infecting your nervous tissue, and it may not have any reason to go there under normal circumstances and no tendency to go there under normal circumstances. But something about human behavior is altering its likelihood of ending up there. And in our monkey model, what we find out is that by introducing things, by breaching barriers that are very well protected, we can actually induce the symptoms of polio just simply by getting um, a pathogen to uh, replicate in an environment that it wouldn't be finding itself in ordinarily, yes. right? That's a very conspicuous pattern to me. Um, and you mentioned briefly in passing here, the proximity of the intestine to the spinal cord. And this is a place where your book caused the dime to drop for me. Um, you want to describe the pattern of development and how it alters that relationship and how it therefore uh, is a match for your hypothesis? Sure. Uh, yeah, this was also a, a sort of a profound revelation as I, a curious person, as I mentioned, and it was just reading and trying to understand the anatomy of the human body and how things grow. If you look at a diagram of an adult human being, the bottom of their spinal cord um, ends well short of their intestines. It, it's inches away, may, maybe more, depending on the human. If you look at the anatomy of an infant or child, their spinal cord reaches all the way to the top uh, of their intestines. Uh, it, it, it sits directly behind their intestines. So as you grow from a child to a human, you, your body grows larger at a much higher rate than your spinal cord itself does in such a way that your spinal cord, the bottom of it ends up in a much different location for adults. So if in fact there is something going on with the combination of pesticide abuse and enteroviral health in your gut, the geographical proximity of your spinal cord to your intestines is such is different in such a way for children than it is for adults, that it would certainly make sense 
that the virus could make the hop that, as you described, very easily when your intestines, those things teeming with millions of enterovirus viruses, rests directly against the spinal cord itself. In an adult, even with their gut integrity completely ruined by rampant pesticide ingestion, the distance from their intestines to their spinal cord is so great that it's not likely to ever make the hop. This is, again, I will stress my hypothesis. We know that pesticides affect the membrane health of uh, cellular membrane health. We know that it does strange things uh, other than, let's say, killing, you know, your microbiome, which is essentially normally in charge of protecting, you know, your, your body from the ravages of enteroviruses. But it also affects the, the cell membranes in such a way they become permeable. Now, there's not a lot of studies about this, but they did study DDT and realize these things were sort starting to happen. So my hypothesis is, if I may just summarize it, pesticides called ran caused rampant problems during the lead arsenic era. They certainly caused rampant problems during the DDT era, which is polio as we know it from the 1940s to the mid-1950s. The real problem was the way in which they got, they wrecked the gut integrity of people's health and allowed what were normally innocuous enteroviruses to flourish and to migrate into the nervous system somehow. We don't know that, it, but it feels like the best solution I've been able to come up with. Yeah, it's a very parsimonious hypothesis. And if I can just rephrase it, so it's, it's so crucial. I want people to understand it maybe from two perspectives. What you're arguing, and there's a lot of interesting detail in the book. For example, there's a shift in the insect, the targeted insect to one that eats fruit from one that eats leaves. What was the second uh, moth that was being oh, targeted in, in your book? Uh, gosh, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I can't remember either. But uh, in any case, there's a, there's a move to an animal Codling that eats moth. fruit. Excuse me, coddling coddling moth. So because crops are now being directly targeted and you've got this new pesticide that's been formulated um, so that it doesn't wash off. Washing off is a problem because every time it rains, you have to reapply. So you, a pesticide that doesn't wash off is advantageous. And then it's being sprayed directly onto fruit because they're being attacked by the coddling moth. And then the point is, even if people are washing that fruit, which they will have done much less than they once would have because they would be used to eating fruit without washing it because there were no pesticides uh, on the fruit to begin with, you know, originally. So you've got people, even if they go to wash the pesticide off, the pesticide is resistant to being washed off because it's rain tolerant. Mm -hmm. So they're ingesting large amounts of it on the fruit. Um, and you've got... So that it's going to, you know, metals are not well tolerated by the body because our ancestors would not have had um, high exposures regularly enough for the body to learn that trick evolutionarily. So your hypothesis is it is damaging the gut's integrity that in infants and children, the proximity of the gut to the spine is uh, quite close that that closeness, the breach in the intestines from the ingestion of pesticides is facilitating the migration of viruses that are fundamentally gut viruses that do mm -hmm. that are not highly virulent. Um, th they are migrating through this path, not because they have any ecological reason to do so, but because the pathway is now open, migrating into tissue where they're demonstrated to have the capacity to uh, reproduce in their reproductive cycle, once they've gotten into the spine, they are producing inflammation, poliomyelitis, um, and that this matches the pattern of polio. It's afflicting children. Um, it is afflicting the neurons that are in the front of the spine, closest physically to the gut, and sparing the neurons in the back of the spine, which is farther from the gut, mm -hmm. and sparing adults because the uh, the spinal cord has moved physically away in the process of growth from the intestines. So even if the gut in an adult 
is damaged, the pathway for the enterovirus to make it into the neuronal tissue uh, is not available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is at the very least an elegant hypothesis to explain a highly complex phenomenon. It also has the attribute of explaining why addressing the enterovirus might have positive effects on uh, polio. Correct. The point is, to, the, if, if there were no virus in that story, if metals were simply uh, migrating from the gut into the spine and damaging tissue, then you would expect that no vaccine could possibly have any impact on that story. But because an enterovirus is finding its way into the uh, the spinal cord, vaccinating against that enterovirus will actually potentially have a positive effect. Yes. Um, but it's not the place where you would naturally intervene in this story. It's a very risky place to intervene in the story. And there's a much more obvious place to intervene, which is uh, at the level of not uh, using pesticides with this effect, having, you know, never putting them on anything anybody's ever going to eat. Uh, you know, protecting people from the metals would be the key way to do it. And I would, uh, so uh, how's that so far? Is that, is that a fair summary? It's a beautiful rendition. I, I wish I could summarize as elegantly as you did. Uh, let me add to that. There is another interesting bullet point that bolsters this hypothesis, which is the ineffectiveness of the Salk vaccine. The Salk vaccine was essentially the first uh, approved treatment for polio infections, and it differed uh, in that it was injected. And, you know, people will think, well, there was a live virus and there was a attenuated virus. And that, that doesn't really matter in this story. The, the real difference between the Salk vaccine, which was first introduced in 1954, pulled from the shelves in 1955 due to a manufacturing problem that killed a few people, it did not work. It flat out didn't work. Now, maybe... It, the reason why is it didn't address the problem of the enteroviral infection. It, if it worked and granted you immunity in your bloodstream, that was fine. But, uh, you know, whatever immunologist may be listening to this, I'm sorry for the cringe here. The uh, stratification between the mucosal immunity and your normal immunity are such that you can't fight off an enteroviral infection by developing immunity in your bloodstream. It's just not going to work. You have to do it in the gut. And that's why the later oral polio vaccine, the one Sabin invented, which essentially started in 61 and then came online fully in 1963, it does work. It actually creates immunity to the poliovirus infection, and it will prevent that infection from flourishing in your gut. Now, there's two problems if you want to you know, go dark here for Dark Horse. Uh, the vaccine only protects against one enterovirus, polio. There's several others that could cause the same problem, which is why the, the numbers didn't, re the vaccine really didn't make the numbers go up or down significantly. And it also is a live virus vaccine, which can occasionally revert to virulence, which means it's currently the only reason the polio virus still exists in the world is probably due to the vaccine itself. I, I, this is not tinfoil hat land. This is sort of acknowledged by scientists. They, they know that it probably naturally would have burned itself out by by now, but unfortunately, the vaccine itself occasionally um, reverts back to its more virulent form, and and uh, and it's kept the the polio vaccine, the polio virus alive longer than it should have. But yeah, you can't create immunity to an enterovirus with a injected vaccine, which is why scientists were so confused as to why the Salk vaccine just didn't appear to work very well. I mean, it did what it was supposed to in a lab. Yes, it created uh, immunity to the viral infection. It didn't stop the paralysis from happening. And they didn't know uh, that there was such a stark difference between what happens in your gut and what happens in the rest of your immune system. Yeah, we, of course, saw this... Um with the so-called COVID vaccines too, where uh, there was no acknowledgement of the distinction between uh, mucosal immunity and systemic. Um, and to this day, I have yet to hear an explanation of um, why that was being ignored. Um, 
But anyway, it's a, uh, it is an important piece of immunology that I think many of us learned in the context of COVID, this distinction, but you've, you've uh, elucidated its relevance here in the context of polio. Um, do you want to flesh out anything else about the story of the change in uh, lead arsenide use or metals in medicine and anything else of that nature that you think should be on the table? Well, at a 50,000 foot view, if you were to look at polio infections from an epidemiological perspective, you could essentially divide it into two stages. Uh, the first of which was a rise and fall that coincides with the rise and fall of the use of lead arsenate. And shortly after World War I, they realized that planes, these things they had never used before outside of, I suppose, um, shooting at each other, they realized they could crop dust with them. That was a new commercial application they had never used before. So uh, the spread of lead arsenate as a pesticide exploded and um, and unfortunately coincided with a, a, a rise in polio. I'm, again, I'm quoting the paralysis at that time. Eventually, um, the FDA was created out, out of mounting concern for the toxicity of lead arsenic. And the FDA came online, other government hearings were held and people complained enough that there started to be some concern that maybe pesticides were being applied too liberally. Maybe there needed to be inspections to see if things were being properly cleaned after they had been sprayed and before the public consumed them. You see another rise, another blip in polio shortly after World War II when DDT began to be used. And a lot of people think that the vaccine vanquished polio uh, because, again, the Salk vaccine, which I would argue doesn't work, and, and many other scientists would, came online in 1954, uh, 55. The Sabin vaccine, which actually works despite its you know problems, it works, came online in 1961 for one strain of polio. There's three strains of polio, for those who don't know. Uh, 1963 was when the actual Sabin vaccine with three that addressed all three types of polio came online. Polio as an epidemic had been long gone before then. It essentially peaked in 1952 and started to die off well before even the Salk vaccine was being used widely. As I mentioned earlier, the Salk vaccine was introduced in 1955 to the nation. There were manufacturing defects which caused it to not be properly um, killed, the virus to not be properly killed. And so it um, caused a bunch of polio, is that correct? Yeah, it, it's unfortunately, it was a horrible story. Uh, I, I think... Um, there are people who suggest that polio is purely a, a pesticide cost problem. And if there's anything that would disprove them wrong, it's the fact that um, an improperly manufactured vaccine, which I will tell you did not have DDT in it, uh, caused, you know, 10 or 11 people to die from polio infection because it had the virus in the vaccine. It was improperly um, inactivated and injected into anyone, you, it's going to hit nervous tissue at some point and it's going to cause problems. So if anyone has any doubt that there is, that polio was purely a pesticide problem, the Cutter incident, which is how this, this whole thing is described, because Cutter was one of the companies manufacturing the vaccine improperly, um, this incident should disprove that very quickly. The, the, the virus is most definitely capable of causing paralysis and death as are several other viruses and bacteria. There is no doubt about that. I, I, I hope people don't walk away from this story and think I'm telling you a pesticide story. Yes, pesticides certainly played a part in it, but it is a microbial story at the end of the day. It, that's really what the problem was. Um, yeah, it, I mean, you know, I, I, what the problem was. Well, what I get from your book and your hypothesis is that it is a story of complexity and that it has a viral component and a toxicological component mm -hmm. and the terrifying fact of polio and it was a terrifying disease yes um was the result of the compounding of these two forces um and the idea that the virus is um a highly virulent critter 
once it has invaded your spine where it would ordinarily have no access and a critter not worthy of comment uh, when it is in your intestines fits very well. The self-inflicted part of this is the place to intervene, mm -hmm. um, not destroying your gut such that the viruses that live in it do not find their way into your spine is the obvious um, the obvious remedy if your hypothesis is correct. And the fact that a virus happens to be present is um, interesting and an important component of the story, but not where one would rationally focus, but for the history of how the epidemic unfolded. And I think this is a, this is a key lesson here, and it, it speaks well of your historical approach to um, the phenomenology here, that by going back and looking at how this unfolded, starting with um, some moth egg sacs that blew off a kitchen windowsill, um, you do see how it is that people came to partial understandings that resulted in uh, self-fulfilling prophecies, etc. Anyway, it's a very it's a very powerful way of looking at it that you wouldn't get if you just simply said, "Well, what's the truth of mm -hmm. the biology here?" You need the historical context in order to understand why the biology uh, played out the way it did. Yeah, it is uh, again from the fifty thousand bit view. It, it is a horrible story and and a sequence of mistakes that were made, uh, starting with an invasive species. Uh, continuing through a ridiculously toxic pesticide that was applied with wanton um, disregard for human health, um, all the way through the mistake of believing that somehow all of this was caused by a single virus. Forget the uh, toxicological component, the, the belief that there was only a single virus capable of crossing from your intestines into your neuronal tissue. And causing paralysis when in fact there were there are several and and probably more than known now than we did then so even then they recognized uh, that this was a complex problem as you described it and because the solution was simple and only addressed one thing we we've come to believe that polio is a simple story and un uh, unfortunately it's a complex story that that won't make it into a 60 minutes episode very well. It, it's a sequence of mistakes uh, that compounded upon each other um, with no true hero at the end. Unfortunately, um, the vaccine was unnecessary and the, even the Sabin vaccine, which does work against the poliovirus itself, um, was in the whole scheme of things, wasn't the hero we thought it was. It, it was the fact that mothers and fathers eventually realized DDT was far more toxic than they initially believed and they complained enough that DDT uh, began uh, to, you know, to come to an end uh, in 52 and 53. You can see that. I mentioned it in the book. You can see it in the Life magazine articles. You can start going through and it's 46, 47, contains DDT, contains DDT. 1952, no DDT. 1953, no DDT contained in this product. So you can just try track the rise and fall of the popularity of the pesticide just through Life magazine articles. But you know, the historical aspect tells you stories that uh, scientists and um, historians won't tell you because there's truth there if you just know where to look. You just have to have enough humility to admit that maybe you were wrong about something you pre previously thought. All right. So a couple more questions before we wrap this up. One, obviously, The Moth in the Iron Lung is your book about poliomyelitis. You've got another book, Crooked. Do you want to describe what that one explores? Sure. Uh, Crooked came about through uh, the realization that there were markers on people's faces that indicated damage uh, from environmental causes that were going unnoticed. And uh, it, what began as sort of a curiosity that people's smiles were um, not as straight as they once were, and people's eyes weren't in a perfect alignment like they once were, um, it, it turned into sort of a more thorough investigation of the role of metal 
and medicine in such a way that it led to a couple of hypotheses about the way uh, allergy came to be, about the way autoimmune conditions came to be, and certainly about the way certain neurological conditions such as autism uh, came to be. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but it was a, a avenue of research that had been diagnosed and um, talked about for 200 years. Uh, it had sort of fallen into obscurity, um, occasionally resurrected by some crackpot here and there. And I just happened to feel like I was just the crackpot who needed to write an entire book about it. Um, so um, <laughs> there were enough that's funnies along the way, such as why do uh, men have a lopsided smile uh, compared to women at the same rate as autism? Why do men smile with the left side low and the right side high um, compared to men who smile with the uh, left side high, right side low? Why is the ratio of that the same as autism and Asperger's disease. Um, these sorts of anomalies intrigued me. And I, I came to uh, write an entire book about what I call man-made disease. And that's what crooked is. Yeah, man-made disease is a, a, a good descriptor. Iatrogenic doesn't doesn't cover it. Uh, that's doctor, that's medicine caused disease. Um, but so man-made disease that's that's good and you mentioned um that when we had our text chat you mentioned that this was part of a trilogy is that right that's right the uh the third book in the series is uh, a working title the infection dilemma and i, I want to subtitle it why we kiss and it's the you know, notion i have wondered about this yeah yeah, I think this is evolutionarily speaking. This is why we kiss. Um, I've it, it doesn't about that make very, sense. Well, I don't know your hypothesis yet, but I uh, I have wondered if it was not a matter of exchanging um, microbes. Is that is yeah, that? Yeah, I'm headed convinced. With that? Uh, there there is not a. Uh, it, it is. It doesn't make any sense other than creatures, familial creatures with whom you are intimate. And I don't mean that sexually necessarily, but in any way. Yep are the people you kiss. And I believe it's meant as an exchange, um, a, an update, if you will, of the firmware to make sure that immunologically you're up to date. I mean, this was essentially the problem with the chickenpox vaccine is naturally roaming chickenpox vac um, infections worked as a natural booster for varicella in such a way that uh, seniors never had to worry about shingles. Um, once children started to get a chickenpox vaccine, it, it crushed the natural boosting effect of natural chickenpox infections, and the elderly uh, lost their immunity to it in such a way that shingles uh, started to come out of the woodwork the minute children started being vaccinated for chickenpox. So now, wait a minute. I, I've wondered about this for a very long time, um, and I hadn't gotten all that far. My sense was... When I was a kid, presumably when you were a kid, uh, it used to be that children were exposed deliberately to smallpox. When some child had it, other kids were Chicken induced pox, yeah. to play. Um, didn't, didn't I say that? You said smallpox, but I, I know what you meant. Chicken wow. Pox is what you meant. Oh, what a terrible error. Um, no, no. Yes, okay. Maybe, maybe uh, we were better off with smallpox parties. No, but we had chickenpox well, parties. <laughs> I'm going to leave smallpox aside for the moment. Um, but deliberately exposing kids to chicken pox was effectively like vaccinating them or sure. like inoculating. the textbook. Yeah. yeah, inoculating them. Uh, but I always resented the fact that I was exposed to chicken pox as a child because of the risk of shingles later in life. And my sense was maybe I would have been better off just simply to dodge the virus entirely. But what mm -hmm. you're telling me is that there's a pattern I don't know about where shingles has become an issue in the aftermath of the chicken pox vaccine. That's right. Yeah, it's it's sort of a one to one ratio. Uh, never a problem before. Um Essentially, uh, when the chickenpox vaccine came out and was introduced into the, you know, the standard uh, pediatric vaccine schedule, um, you know, it does work in some way. The vaccine does work. Uh, 
Chickenpox is a completely trivial childhood illness with essentially no ill effect other than you get out of school for a day or two and everybody loved it for that. Right. Reason. It makes you smarter by keeping you out of school. <laughs> well, that's 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 another meta, uh, a whole nother meta level. I wasn't going to go. But yes. So, uh, yeah, within years of of children all being uh, vaccinated for chickenpox. With, with less naturally roaming chickenpox infections going on, uh, adults weren't exposed to it in the micro-boosting way that they were in the past. This is the theory, of course. I, I won't say this is fact. Nope, that's the hypothesis, but I like it. I'm sorry, the hypothesis. And yes, uh, shingles, uh, I won't say exploded, but w within years, shingles incidences rose such that uh, science came to the rescue with a shingles vaccine. Um, essentially the result of a chickenpox vaccine. So it's nice. a win-win for pharma. Well, I don't know, of course, having not looked into the pattern of emergence, I don't know if what you're reporting is accurate, though I'm impressed with a lot of the research you've done, so I would imagine it probably is right. But if that's right, that's a very conspicuous pattern, and it would answer a longstanding question for me. Um, all right. If I might ask you... Uh, one last question here, and it's sort of a delicate one. I hope you will uh, take it in the spirit in which I ask it. Um, I don't know how to ask it, really. Just are you an, are you an anti vaxxer Have were you, were you sure. always one? If you are one now, uh, and if not, how did you become one? Uh, yeah, I can. You're not offending me. I can answer that question easily. Um, I'm afraid of offending you with the answer, but given that we're both adults here uh, and, and separated by thousands of miles, I'll go ahead and tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be safe even if you were sitting exactly. in the same room, yeah, I promise. It's like they say, never walk, a, uh, never criticize a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. Uh, that way you're a mile away. And also you have issues. And he, yeah, you have issues. Exactly. <laughs> That's a car talk. That's a car talk quote. <laughs> I started completely with complete belief that vaccines were the most important medical discovery of all time, more than antibiotics, more than surgery, the, the two others you mentioned. I, I was as convinced as anyone was. I slowly made the descent into madness to where you now find me. I, the journey, I'll, I'll sum it up in 60 seconds. The journey was, well, um, Maybe the polio vaccine actually wasn't as necessary as we thought. Maybe we could have solved the problem with doing away with rampant pesticide use. I got to, well, actually, the polio vaccine was completely unnecessary, but the others are necessary. The others, these diseases were horrible. Uh, through additional research and, reason, and, and understanding that the measles Infection was an innoc innocuous infection that no one ever died from with uh, proper levels of nutrition, vitamin A in particular. I started to think, well, why was a measles vaccine invented? No one was dying of it in the United States. It wasn't a rampant, terrible disease. Why did they do it? Well, it was because they could. It was because they thought they could eradicate the disease with a vaccine. And if you study measles, you will understand it started with the promise of eradication. You know, everyone gets the vaccine within two or three years, it'll be eradicated. And, and on and on it goes till the point it's not eradicated. So I, I transitioned into the, well, maybe there are some vaccines that are useful and others that really you don't need. I, I then made the jump to what I call a first world anti-vaxxer, which is, uh, well, we need vaccines uh, in the third world. They don't have the medical care or nutrition that we might have here. So uh, sure, maybe a couple of hippies in California can afford to skip it. But if everyone skipped it, and then, especially in the third world, no, you know, we have to do that. We, we'll lose herd immunity. I then realized herd immunity uh, was a falsity in, in the case of several vaccines. And, and I'm beginning to wonder uh, if it's completely false for all vaccines. Most, you will know this, certainly with all the COVID and uh, vaccine research you've done, the, the, the notion of herd immunity is, is false for the COVID vaccine. It doesn't prevent its spread. Several other vaccines are certainly incapable of preventing its spread, and some of them, in fact, encourage its spread, such as the oral polio vaccine that Bill Gates administers in mass all across countries throughout the world. So I am now at the point, I apologize 
uh, dear friend, I am at the point where I believe vaccines are completely unnecessary, even in the third world. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard Bobby Kennedy mentioned the Dr. Peter A.B. study in Africa where he, they followed a, a large co cohort of children who had gotten the um, DTaP vaccine and those who hadn't, and the mortality rate of those who had gotten the vaccine was 10 times higher. This is Dr. Peter A. A. B. is considered the godfather of vaccination in Africa. So for him to admit this in a paper, you have to understand that this is a significant event. I'm now at the point where I am so opposed to vaccination, I, if I had the power, would ban all of them. I would outlaw every single one. I don't think any of them are worth it. I think the costs, the risks from neurological illness, from autoimmunity, from even allergy itself, all three things that never existed before the widespread advent of mass vaccination, I think the damage they have caused is so severe that one day they will be completely banned from humanity. Now, again, I apologize. Uh, I didn't start that way. I wasn't crazy always. Uh, through a lot of research, I've come to that point. Well, okay. Uh, let me say a few things in that context. One, um, what Heather and I have encountered with respect to COVID has put us in a very awkward situation. Of course. With many people who would otherwise uh, have no problem with us. And I've started when... I, when people say, oh, um, you know, what's your podcast about that kind of thing? I've started saying that Heather and I are terrible people who've come to believe unforgivable things. And I say that because it skips a dozen steps in the process of discovery. And it alerts people that I'm aware that what I am saying uh, will come across in a particular way. And yet I am there because I think it's the right conclusion, mm -hmm. right? So we can skip all the part where you tell me, I don't understand what's going on. The answer is yes, I've considered that possibility. And yet here I am. And it sounds to me like you are, you have a, a version of this yourself. Um, I also, my children are, well, I don't, I don't know anything about your uh, family history, but my children are fully vaccinated up to the point where COVID happened. We, none of us got the COVID vaccines or so-called vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had it to do over again, I would think very carefully about each and every one of the vaccines they got, because um, I am aware that many of the stories that we are told are at least wildly incomplete. I did not know what an adjuvant was <laughs> until beginning to dig into this. And I am now spooked at anything that depends on that mechanism. It does not strike me as a biologically sound mechanism to induce immunity, even if the vaccine works. The consequence of the irritants that are used to induce the immune system to overreact to an otherwise weak antigen, um, that's not a reasonable thing to do. And if you were going to do it, it should come with some sort of a warning about what other things you might want to avoid while your immune system was in this hyperactive state. Um, I also know from the portion of your book, Crooked, that uh, I have already um, read that um, the, the effect of the antigens uh, does not anticipate the duration that they, did I say antigens? Adjuvants. Adjuvants. The the, the longevity of the adjuvants in one's system far exceeds what they lead us to believe um, when telling us how safe and effective these vaccines that they want to give us are. So in any case, I'm, uh, I'm of two beliefs. One, the mechanism that we are using to produce vaccines is not trustworthy. And in that context, um, what the net effect of the vaccine schedule is, is deeply in doubt. And with respect to each of the component vaccines, I think extreme caution is warranted. That is not the same thing as saying that I'm not a believer in principle in the idea of vaccination and that a proper system 
might not produce vaccines that were worth the cost. I don't know that it would, but I am certainly uh, open to the possibility that there would be vaccines worth having or circumstances in which it would be uh, worth contemplating that mechanism. But um, we don't live in that world, and that puts me in a very awkward spot. Mm -hmm. It's possible that the entire story of vaccination is incorrect. It's also possible that the basic story of vaccination is correct, but the business model surrounding the production of these things is so horrifying that it results in us inflicting harm on innocent people who deserve to be protected um, for no uh, justification whatsoever. So in any case, I know that's complex. No. I don't wish to overcomplicate this, but... I do think we have to leave open the possibility that even if there's a tremendous amount of harm being done by modern vaccines, that that's not an indictment of the principle. Of course not. In principle, I, I wish, you know, from my perspective, I wished they worked. I wished they were safer than they are, apparently. I wish they worked more effectively than they do. I wish they didn't depend on adjuvants to achieve any sort of effect. But unfortunately, um, it, it's a cheat that I think Mother Nature detects and and you won't win that battle. I think, in my opinion, natural immunity is unfortunately the only way. Um, I think the human body in, in a properly nourished and in you know a stress-free environment, which isn't always possible, but the human body is perfectly capable of dealing with infection and in fact thrives through it. As I mentioned at the beginning, the notion of telling you, new parent, your child must receive steroid injections so they don't have to go outside and exercise is so patently absurd yet we do the exact same thing um, with infection and that and that's the the subject of the infection dilemma the book i was mentioning the third book of the trilogy which is to suppose that infection is not uniformly evil and in fact it is a necessary requirement for robust health and to try and cheat your way through it any other way is asking for trouble well, it's funny, uh, George Carlin um, nailed this one. I, I won't I, I won't try to recreate his uh, his line, but his basic point was he was so healthy because he spent so much time swimming in the Hudson River, you know, basically in filth and it <laughs> made yeah. his immune system robust. Um, yeah. But I will point out that one thing that I have become increasingly suspicious of, and in fact, I was gratified to see you call it out in your in your book and to add some detail to what i understood is that there's a difference between the technology of vaccination and inoculation with a syringe um or with a hypodermic needle is really what i mean i used to think a hypodermic needle was an elegant intervention that it minimally, it did minimal harm to deliver something very potent and therapeutic. I now think that the breaching of the skin with a hypodermic needle is a hyper novel event. And that the difference, for example, between, um, well, uh, back in the day when I was more of a believer in the currently available vaccines, I never thought they were safe. I didn't think that that was mm -hmm. possible, but I thought they were on balance worth it and well tested, which I now no longer believe. But um, we used to be told, you know, is there mercury in this vaccine? Yes, but it's less than you would get in a tuna fish sandwich. Well, A, there shouldn't be any mercury in a tuna fish sandwich. That's a human screw up to begin with. Yeah. Um, and nobody says it's safe. And in fact, pregnant women are told to limit their intake of that because we know yeah. it isn't safe. But the other thing is, it's a false analogy. The quantity of mercury injected into you versus that same quantity ingested has a radically different implication for where that mercury ends up. And because of active transport, basically, because mm -hmm. it's not good for you to eat mercury, but um, the, 
fact that you don't have a history transporting it actively across the gut means that it is effectively outside your body. You know, your alimentary canal is topologically outside of your body. That's very different than injecting it into uh, your muscle or subdermally. And so in any case, I have come to understand that I had the hypodermic needle exactly wrong. It is a radical intervention capable of um, creating disease to which you would otherwise be immune by breaching barriers uh, in a way that nature does not anticipate. And so anyway, I, uh, I guess I discovered through your book that the invention of the hypodermic needle um, is much later than I had expected, which of course, if I had thought carefully about it, I would have realized because mm -hmm. the refinement necessary to get a needle that would be useful in that regard uh, is late emerging. Yeah. Uh, well, if you continue to read Crooked, uh, which I partly hope you will and partly apologize for you having done it, you will see that the notion that the dose makes the poison is also, in fact, incorrect, um, especially when it comes to aluminum adjuvant. There, there was always the notion that there were only microscopic amounts of adjuvant in the vaccine and they can't possibly be enough to harm. But uh, one of the main hypotheses of the Crooked book is uh, suggesting otherwise that um, in fact, when large doses of aluminum adjuvant are injected into your body, your body forms protective nodules around the adjuvant. It, it forms these granules that you can actually feel under your skin. Um, when, it's, when it's in microscopic amounts, your body doesn't respond so aggressively and, and it uh, escapes into your bloodstream. And there's another uh, component of that, which is even more nefarious, I won't go into right now, but... Um, <laughs> The reason uh, why I believe aluminum adjuvant in vaccines is probably one of the most heinous crimes against humanity we've ever committed. But um, it's, well, it, it's an interesting book. And it, one more thing, it, you know, I mentioned the autism vaccine, another book. I, I, I think I sent you a copy. That is a story of aluminum adjuvant. If you are enjoying or horrified at reading about adjuvants, that goes into great detail about the history uh, and invention of adjuvant and why they had to use it. So I, I do recommend you give that book a shot when you get a, when you get a minute. Excellent. Um, your point about the dose not necessarily making the poison reminds me of the basic lesson that I think of this whole podcast and of much of your work is welcome to complex systems because um, you know ordinary we have simple rules for complicated systems like chemistry. Right in chemistry, the temperature uh, increases the rate of reaction. Once you get into biology, biochemistry, that's not true anymore. It's true to a point, and then there's a point at which heat disrupts the enzymes that are facilitating the reaction. I see. And so the point is a simple rule that you learn in a complicated system and then you apply in a complex system can get you into huge danger because you think it still applies and something has changed that you weren't alerted to. So I, I think someday we will understand that a huge fraction of disease is the result of this one simple error. It's a complex system and we are still very new to complex systems in terms of understanding them. So our basic approach ought to be uh, disrupt them as little as possible. The closer you can get to putting the creature in an environment that looks like its ancestral environment and a, an adult environment that looks like the childhood environment, the healthier the creature is going to be. And every time you do something, even things that you don't think should make a difference, like, you know, uh, glazed windows or a light switch that uh, causes a bulb in your room to put out exactly the photons you need to get your work done. These things seem, how could that possibly be harmful? But, you know, once you come to understand our relationship with different wavelengths of light, you realize that these are both rather like the hypodermic needle, much more radical in their departure from the analog that your ancestors knew than they seem. They seem mm -hmm. minimal. They are in fact radical and uh, human health hangs in the balance. I have a pet hypothesis that sunglasses are causing the rise in, in skin cancer incidents and that uh, your eyes are your body's natural modulator 
for um, melatonin production and that going out in full sun with sunglasses on prevents your body from uh, reacting to what it should naturally do, which is to increase melatonin production. So I've, <laughs> I've stopped wearing sunglasses. <clears throat> Again, something that seems like a natural, fine, innocuous thing, but I, I have a feeling right. it may be impacting us. I think that's, uh, I think this is a perfect, <laughs> a perfect analog for the, our relative position here. I find you utterly extreme in your, uh, opposition to sunglasses, um, because driving requires them sometimes. Um, but other than that, you're probably right about them. And I have wondered this too, that it does not seem like Well, a, consider uh, driving without sunglasses, going to the gym, your, your eyes will adjust, you know, they, they get better. The muscles that contract no, no. your pupils get better with time and it's not such a pain because it hurt at you first know, for funny. me, but I'm, I'm a real hardcore enthusiast now and I could stare directly at the eclipse and it won't hurt a thing. <laughs> my, uh, my children have gone skiing for the day and, um, I scolded my younger son, uh, because he was heading out on this journey without sunglasses for driving. Um, but I will tell you nowhere in my mind was it necessary for him to have them just because he was driving and it was sunny out. It's for that very rare circumstance where you're driving you know, where the sun is setting right over the highway and you, you're squinting and it's making it impossible to see whether there are other cars. I have no doubt you can get better at it, but I still think you need to have them in the car, even if you're right, that in general, you shouldn't be wearing them. Yeah, maybe so. But yeah. I, I, I like the Eskimo bone sunglasses, the ones with the little slits on them. That, that They were the sunglasses. Those, those are so cool. <laughs> I can't. I, I can't believe they haven't made it into a Dune movie yet. I can't believe a production artist somewhere hasn't said we need the Eskimo bone glasses for some of we our characters. We need the Eskimo bone glasses. Is exactly right. Yeah. No, I agree. They are super cool, and they do suggest actually another uh, factor here, which I was going to mention because my kids are skiing and they're going to wear their uh, sunglass goggles. That the snow changes this too, because you can damage your retina with. Um, reflection off the snow and the mm -hmm. fact that Inuits used those bone glasses suggests that although that was their native habitat, that because their ancestry did not involve um, living on the ice, um, that a, a technological intervention was presumably positive for them. Mm -hmm. That's right. It, and it does make you wonder about the, the, the eye shape of that, those people which have that, uh, I can't remember what the name is called, the, the cantle tilt or whatever, you know, if that was a, an adaptation for living on snow, because that's essentially yeah, what the Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, but uh, yeah. yeah, well, that's a, that's uh, here's to your sunglasses. I, I, I raise you a toast. I enjoyed, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed the eclipse sunglass free, um, but I did, did have you? an incredible headache the next day. So maybe I'm not as robust as I'm making myself out to be. Yeah. Not, none of us are. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, Forrest Moretti, and I know I've pronounced it correctly. Yeah, you um, did. It's, it's been a pleasure. Um, I do recommend that I, I would recommend people start with uh, The Moth and the Iron Lung. Yeah. Um, it it's is not too uh, It's a great read. It's such a perfect example of what complex systems will do to your complicated thinking. It's beautifully researched. And I would also point out it is available as an audiobook. It's very enjoyable as an audiobook. Um, so you can uh, listen to it while you're driving around with your sunglasses nearby, but not on. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, uh, so thanks for joining me. And uh, to everybody else, thanks for listening.